All right, it is the top of the hour. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAGT webinar. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. Uh, on the screen, there's a link to the webinar series where you can find the full schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can also find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we do encourage you to enter those into the chat box, which we'll be monitoring. A reminder as well that all participants in NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT Code of Conduct. This applies in all venues to all events and all online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT Code of Conduct policy, which I've linked to in the chat box um, for any details. Today's webinar is titled Developing a Sense of Place During Distance Learning, and it's presented by Steve Semkin of Arizona State University, Carrie Ferraro from Rutgers University, and Tara Ledlaw from the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. In this webinar, they'll explore several, several approaches for inc incorporating sense of place into distance learning, in, including taking virtual field trips, ta tapping into local knowledge, and using a community's shared experience as a springboard. Thank you all for participating in the NAGT webinar series and uh, go ahead and take it away. Juke, you ready to go or you gonna say something first or? Are we all set, Juke? Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm Steve Sempkin from ASU and I'm happy to be here today for this NEGT webinar. Um, I just want to mention that I'm actually in rural Arizona right now, and there's a very slim but uh, non-zero non chance that my internet might waver a little bit, and I apologize for that in advance, but uh, Juke has the slides, so she'll be running those. I'm going to be talking for a little while about the idea of sense of place. This uh, this webinar is about sense of place, uh, sense of place, particularly evoking a sense of place during distance learning. But I wanted to start by just sort of giving a primer on what, what sense of place is and how it, how it applies to geoscience teaching and learning in general. So most of the examples I'm gonna draw early on come from face-to-face uh, -face teaching, but then I'm gonna carry it on to the idea of, of distance learning. So if I could have the next slide. Start off with a couple of definitions. Um, first of all, what is a place? There are many, many different ways to envision or describe a place. And I like to work with the geographic term, which is that a place is any locality, whether it is real, virtual, or even imaginary. And you can see examples of all of these here that people have imbued with meaning through experience. Any kind of experience we have, whether we actually set foot there, whether we look at it from a distance, whether we conduct any kind of activities there, or whether we simply imagine it and dream about it. Any one of these is experience that then renders a, a plain locality in perhaps in, in three dimensions or in, in space with meaning and makes it a place. So a place is a human construct rather than just a, a physical locality. Uh, next slide, please. Now, many people 
uh, tend to imbue places with, with many different meanings, places particularly really meaningful places like, for example, national parks like Grand Canyon National Park, they tend to be imbued with an evolving myriad of meanings. Okay, so myriad, lots of different meanings. You can see different examples here of some of the meanings that have been affixed to Grand Canyon by all the people who've experienced it through time from uh, aesthetic value to spiritual and ceremonial and cultural value, scientific value, historical, educational, recreational, and even um, uh, values related to sustainability and disputes over whether uh, the land should be used in one purpose or another. And we say that these meanings are negotiated through time because as different people come to places, they, they see them in different ways and we, we tend to agree, we tend to negotiate as to which meanings are gonna be the ones that prevail. Like for example, with a, a national park, uh, we have generally agreed that these are lands that need to be set aside and preserved for all of these different significances that you've seen there. So again, a place is a, is a location that has been given meaning by human experience. Next slide, please, Juke. Um, I like to tell my students to think about places as the cultural equivalent of, of landforms. Okay, if we think about a natural landscape like the Delmarva Peninsula and Chesapeake Bay there on the left, you know, we can think of a, a landscape that is populated with landforms and with uh, hydrological features and with ecosystems and all of these things together make up a physical or a natural landscape. But at the same time, there really isn't anywhere on earth that human beings have not either set foot or had some kind of activity, or again, just simply named and thought about places. And so we, we have essentially interwoven a cultural landscape into all parts of the natural landscape. And I think of places as the cultural equivalents of the landforms that nature forms. So natural processes create landforms and human beings create places. And this is not really a new idea. I mean, you can go back uh, quite a ways into the scholarship of geography. And for example, Carl Sauer, a geographer from the early 20th century at uh, University of California, put it this way, said that landscape may be defined as an area made up of a distinct association of forms, both physical and cultural. But I think it's this duality, this natural cultural duality that's at the heart of what a place is and, and what place-based education is about. Next slide, please, Juke. So it's all important to note too that place making, uh, place making is a, is a uh, innately human behavior. I mean, whenever we set foot or we think about a place, we do things like we give it names, we give it meanings, and so we're making places. And that's really inseparable from our activities in natural and social sciences, both research and education. So we study and teach about nature in and by means of places. Um, great philosopher of place, Edward Casey, who's a professor at Stony Brook University, uh, has written extensively on our philosophical connection to places. He puts it this way, that our access to space and time is how they happen in a given place. We, we cannot study nature without making places in nature from which we stand and from which we, we uh, perceive and collect data. So we basically study and teach about nature in and by means of places all the time. Certainly that's true in the geosciences. Uh, scientific knowledge that accrues uh, also becomes part of the meanings that accrue to places. We, as we, as we experience these places and we affix different kinds of meanings to them, the scientific knowledge that we obtain in those places becomes part of that set of meanings. And the scientific enterprise itself contributes to placemaking. Like for example, Tranquility Base on the Moon. That was a place that we established for purposes of exploration and scientific research, and we made that a place. But important to note too, that our relationship to place influences how we interrogate places, how we learn from them, how we understand them and how we teach in and about them. And this is really what got me interested in the whole idea of sense of place to begin with, that so many indigenous cultures like Native Hawaiians and, and Native Americans in the, in the 48 states, uh, Native Alaskans have these cultures that are deeply rooted in place. And that connection to place influences all aspects of culture and life. And so uh, it must also influence the way we, we do, you know, for all people, influence the way that we, we do science and we understand science and also teach about it. And of course, this different, these different ranges of place meanings that tend to be very culturally mediated are going to have an influence on, on our capacity to teach geoscience to, to diverse students uh, now and in the future. Next slide, please. 
So what about our relationship to place? Um, we have a little, before I talk more about that, we have a little activity that we can do here for everybody to participate. And uh, Juke has got uh, pulled everywhere going. So uh, maybe you'll step in if you wanna tell people how to do this. But what I'd like everybody to do for a moment is to think about a place that is meaningful to you in some way and think about why it's meaningful and then think about how you feel when you think about this place. And when you thought about this for a moment, go ahead and please enter your, your ideas uh, and your thoughts in poll everywhere and we'll get, we'll get a word cloud. So we'll see, we'll see what people come up with. So please go ahead and do that. I'll say quickly that the link is in the chat box if you'd like a quick way to get there. So I see Big Ben muted, yep. I'd like you all to note as these, as these come in, notice the, all of the different meanings that people affix to these. Not only are the places very diverse, but the meanings and the, the emotional feelings that people have tend to be very diverse, which is not, not unexpected at all because it has everything to do with the way that, that human beings relate to places. Ah, the wave in our neighborhood. Yes, I agree with Brett. This is a this is a great flow of ideas, and it's it's a great illustration of what we'll what we'll refer to in just a moment. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Ha, huh, I was a teaching assistant at a geology class in Rainbow Basin back in my grad school days. That is a great place. Yes, AJ makes a really good point about the difference in scale. And that's one thing I didn't, I didn't bring up in a, in, a, in a slide, but the fact is that there's places are, are indeed scale invariant. And any, any location that has meaning to you or meaning to some people can be considered a place. And so it can go, you know, it ex, can expand from 
something on a planetary scale all the way down to something on a very personal scale. Um, there's a, a great book that's in the list of, uh, of recommended references for this webinar uh, by Cresswell about places. And um, he mentions that even a, you know, a comfortable chair where you sit and do all of your thinking and all of your meditating, that's a place too. So, I mean, the place can be all the way down to that, that small a scale. And, and it's very interesting how these, these different places coming up on the, on the pole everywhere are showing these different scales as well. Okay, well, this is really wonderful. And uh, we have a large group of people with lots of different, different places. And, and uh, all of these responses are going to be saved. They're all gonna be saved on this. And I think we'll have a chance to look at them sooner. I think probably we're gonna have to move on now just because we have more of the webinar. So I apologize to anybody whose, whose uh, comments have not yet been posted, but they will be, they'll be up here. And thanks to everybody for the, for the comments you posted, but we'll go ahead, Juka, we can, we can go on. Hopefully what everybody noticed from these things, besides the, the diversity of types of places and diversity of meanings of places is also the diversity of personal attachments that are represented by what people have said here. And in the next slide, we'll address that. So when we imbue a place with a meaning, when we, when we put meanings on place, not a meaning, but typically diverse meanings, it's also in our nature to become emotionally attached to these places, or in some cases, even there's a negative attachment and in a aversion. But um, it's in our nature to have an emotional connection as well as an intellectual connection. If we think of the, the meanings as primarily the intellectual connections, although they do overlap with emotional, we can think of place attachments as the emotional side. And uh, in many cases, it is an affirmative attachment. We fall in love with a place, it becomes important to us, but it's also possible to, for whatever reason, to, to be averse to a place. And we consider that as a, as a negative personal attachment. But the interesting thing about attachments is that they do sort of fall along a scale. Uh, we, can, we can rank attachments along a scale where one end might be essentially um, uh, a, being oblivious of a place, okay? Having really no interest in the place or any concern about it whatsoever. And at the other end of the scale, it's willingness to, to make personal sacrifices to protect or to sustain that place. So, you know, the attachments can fall anywhere along that scale. If we take all of the meanings that, that any individual or any group, plus the attachments that they form for a given place and combine them, that's what we refer to as the sense of place. Sense of place comes out of geographic and environmental psychology theory. And it is a construct which actually makes it possible to render these somewhat esoteric connections, particularly attachments, tangible. And as we'll see in a moment, not just tangible. Next slide, please. So the sense of place in, in an educational way, we can say it operationalizes our connection to place because it allows us to actually work with that connection. And because of the rootedness of sense of place in theory and practice, there are ways that we can identify and measure it by means of both quantitative and qualitative research methods. And I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on these, but you can see quantitatively, there are a number of validated published surveys of place attachment, place meaning, which can allow us usually through a Likert scale from uh, you know, uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree, we can get a numerical score that, that correlates very well with how people feel attached or, or find meanings in a given place. But we have a number of ethnographic methods as well. We can directly observe how people interact with place and we can tease out different kinds of meanings and different kinds of practices that people have when they interact. And again, it can be in the physical environment, it can also be in the virtual environment. We can do interviews and focus groups with people to ask how their, their attachments to place change over the course of a place-based uh, educational program or how some kind of activity in a place uh, influence their attachment and, the, and their range of meanings. We could do it in larger groups, focus groups, Delphi groups. And we can also conduct a textual and graphic analyses of things that people are inspired or tasked to create as a manifestation of their sense of place. Like the illustration you see there is a concept sketch one of my students did on uh, environmental issues and sustainability in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. And, and from these, these uh, 
these things that people create, we can also tease out the idea of sense of place that way. So there are lots of different ways we can do it. A number of papers cited at the lower left there, and then several of them have been uh, uh, have been submitted in the list of, of references. So next slide, please, Jude. And sense of place is at the heart of place-based teaching. And I characterize place-based teaching as that form of teaching that situates exploration and inquiry in places, in specific places that we identify and that we work with. We draw our examples from there and it interweaves the elements of natural and cultural landscapes and teaching. That duality of nature and culture, I think is also very essential to place-based teaching. So, and um, so next slide, please. So a little bit on the research. Uh, we have a lot of research now that indicates that sense of place is indeed a, a teachable and measurable learning outcome for place-based teaching. And uh, several of us, Emily Ward, uh, Dima Savi, Pauline Chin and I uh, wrote a review paper a couple of years ago back in JGE where we looked at a lot of this, uh, this prior work, including some of our own. And you can see, you can read through this list of, of different findings relating to sense of place as a, as a learning outcome for place-based ge geoscience teaching. Uh, while you look at these, I'll mention again that, that there are many learning outcomes that place-based teaching has in common with other forms of, of situated learning, you know, content, knowledge, and skills, certainly. But we think that sense of place, teaching and learning the sense of place, meaning enhancing the meanings and the attachments that people feel for places, is, is what distinguishes place-based teaching from, from other forms of, of situated teaching and learning. So next slide, please, Jude. I know there's a lot on these slides. Hopefully everybody has a chance to look. It's also interesting to note that other researchers have shown that sense of place happens to be synergistic, maybe not surprisingly, but synergistic with other factors that are quite relevant to natural science learning, uh, including engagement of students, um, how their interaction with the physical environment actually shapes a sense of place, and the other way around, how we interpret natural phenomena. One of the really key points is that sense of place is seen to correlate with pro-environmental attitudes and behaviors by students. So if the more they, the, the richer their sense of place becomes, the more interested they are in preserving and sustaining and protecting that place. Um, and also that connections with earth that are manifested in places may be a strong uh, motivator for geoscience learning. Next slide, please. So how do we do it? People say, you know, well, okay, we want to we want to use sense of place. We want to use that duality. How do we teach in a place-based way? So uh, with my colleagues, we did a meta-analysis of a number of prior examples of people doing place-based education. And we came up with these five design elements for place-based teaching, symbolized by the inscription of a hand into red sandstone, again, showing that, that natural and cultural duality. And those five design elements are to focus content on the natural attributes of the place under study and to meaningfully integrate cultural attributes of the place under study in appropriate ways to add context and relevance. Now that's a perspective that's focused on sort of teaching from a natural science perspective. If this were, let's say a place-based social science course, you might reverse those two fingers that, that the cultural attributes would be the main content and the natural attributes of the context. But the key point is that when you're teaching, say you're teaching geology in a landscape, it's also important to note that that landscape has other meanings. There may be indigenous knowledge about landforms, about features, about processes. Uh, there may be different names. There may be different perspectives. Uh, some people, I know Katya brought up in the, in the chat that, that many senses of place conflict over you know, how we're going to recognize the place and what we're gonna do with it. And integrating that kind of knowledge as context for the science, showing that, that it isn't just a place to learn about the earth, but it's a place that for, on its own merits has significance to human beings. And that's what makes it even more worthy of study. So that's those first two fingers. The third one is to teach with authentic experiences in that place, ideally out in the field or out in the community, but uh, absent that in an environment that evokes that place. And here's where the idea of distance learning and uh, remote learning come in and, and uh, virtual learning environments. Uh, the fourth principle is to teach ideas and practices for environmental and cultural resilience and sustainability. So as we teach about a place, we also want to teach our students to feel responsibility for that place and to help sustain both the natural uh, environment as well as the cultural environment. And then finally, encourage students to form their own intellectual and emotional connections to place 
by enriching their senses of place. And there are lots of examples from the literature uh, cited in this review paper that you can look at. I wish we had time to, uh, if I had an hour, I could talk about specific examples, but instead I'm gonna just ask Duke to move on. So we have other presentations. You're gonna see some great examples of how you put these ideas into practice uh, from the other presenters today. So if we could have the next slide, Duke. Um, I wanna point out though that, that we have these five design elements, but it's not necessary to necessarily adhere to all of them to teach in a place-based way because place-based teaching is in fact a continuum. You start simply by, if you use examples, just pointing out that they're real places. Okay, for example, that, that illustration there that's sometimes referred to as Devil's Tower, also referred to as Bear Butte, which is the indigenous name for it. It's an igneous feature but it has considerable cultural value and considerable knowledge and history associated with it. And if you do nothing more than just point that out when you're using it as an example, then you've set yourself on the continuum toward place-based teaching where the other end is where place itself becomes the subject. And many, many different disciplines bring their knowledge and skills together and merge them so that now it really becomes a course about place rather than a course about say earth science or geography or engineering or social sciences and sense of place is absolutely the authentic learning objective in that case next slide please so we're going to be talking about uh, virtual environments, distance learning. I want to point out the work of Vipin Aurora at uh, Oregon State University, who's been working for quite some time on the idea of a virtual sense of place. This is a fairly busy uh, table, but I want to point out that the work of Vipin Aurora has basically shown that all of the attributes of place-based teaching that we can do in an in-person or on-ground environment map into the virtual environment. So if we're going to teach with authentic experiences, we can do so in the virtual environment by mimicking familiar settings, using a variety of technologies, diversifying learning activities, and require at least some activities to be collaborative among students, just as if they were out in the field, let's say, working together. Um, many other things that work in the on-ground or in-person environments translate directly, uh, such as modeling strong place attachment. We found that if, if the instructor exhibits a strong sense of place, that's, that typically gets picked up by the students and they respond to that. Um, and again, this, this idea of integrating the duality of nature and culture, the natural and cultural attributes and natural and cultural resilience and sustainability. And one of the papers in the, uh, the readings is Hoke et al, which talks about this. And I encourage people to have a look at this if they're more interested in exploring this idea of the virtual sense of place, how we can evoke that. From, from the standpoint of sort of first principles of study. Next slide, please, Jude. And I just wanna point out, um, this is not something we necessarily are able to indulge much in, in with COVID, but um, the next advance, which we're doing at ASU right now, and I see Tom Roberto is one of the uh, people on, on board this uh, webinar. He's my, my PhD student is actually leading the effort in this. And this is teaching students to create their own virtual field experiences and virtual field trips. Um, as a way to essentially enhance their own sense of place. Go out into the field with increasingly economical audiovisual capture tools, working with uh, fairly easy to work with open source platforms and students are able to, uh, to develop their own virtual field experiences and uh, create their own works and, and essentially become, rather than consumers of, of virtual learning tools, producers of the same. And uh, next slide, please. I think this is almost to the end here. So again, research on the sense of place in the virtual realm, uh, we find a number of things, including Tom's own uh, thesis, where he found that uh, virtual field experiences, while they don't supplant in on ground field experiences, they can actually complement them and even promote them. Besides making localities globally accessible, they do actually work to assuage student preoccupations with things not having to do with learning, access, safety, physical comfort, uh, interpersonal relationships, which have been characterized as novelty space by the early work of, of or near Orion and, and Avi Hofstein. Um, interestingly, many users find when they're on a, a narrated or guided virtual field experience, they feel a lot more uh, intimate, more individualized with the, with the instructor or trip leader than they would be on a large on ground trip where everybody's kind of jockeying for position and trying to get close to the presenter. Um, and we do find, in fact, from mostly from qualitative research at this point, that when students do produce their own VFEs, it does deepen their sense of place as well as their 
pro-social and pro-environmental dispositions and actions toward the places they document. Next slide, please, Jude. So I think that's it, yes. So I, I thank you very much. This is a all too brief kind of fast, uh, fast forward introduction to the idea of sense of place, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about this with people. If you have any questions later on, uh, there is my website and my email is just semkin at asu.edu. So feel free to, uh, to contact me anytime if you have questions and thank you very much. I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Duke and to the next presenter who I think is Carrie. Thank you so much, Steve. That was wonderful. Thank you, Juke. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Ferraro from Rutgers University. And um, today I just wanted to share some examples of how my wonderful colleagues at Rutgers and I are working to foster a sense of place in our students. Next slide, please, Juke. Uh, before I move forward, though, I would like you to share one word or phrase that comes to mind when you think of New Jersey. And please be honest, I've heard it all already, so I won't be insulted. So you can uh, go ahead and text or, again, kind of uh, use the link to answer this. Bruce, yeah, beaches. <laughs> Garden State, nice. Post-industrial, big hair. Yeah, I have often been told, asked why my hair is not higher. Um, <laughs> casinos, Meadowlands, yeah, Turnpike. Yeah, <laughs> I often get ex asked what Turnpike exit I'm at. I'm from. Okay. Instant mm -hmm. Ocean. Great, yeah, this, this is, this is great. And I, I think, you know, there's, I see a lot of, a, a lot of themes and actually a lot more positive themes. <laughs> so that's very nice. Now I don't have to send, you know, all my mafia friends to your houses to, <laughs> to tell you the wonders of New Jersey. No, I'm just kidding. This is, this is great. <laughs> yeah, you're on your best behavior. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Next slide, please, Juke. Um, so why did I ask you this? Well, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about at, um, at Rutgers is how do we foster a sense of place in students who have not visited our campus or local areas because of remote learning? Um, this image on the left is actually a screenshot of a conversation that I had very recently with my sister-in-law who is not from New Jersey, um, who thinks that all of New Jersey looks like this, or because there's a highway um, separating the students from the local environment where here where at Rutgers, our New Brunswick campus, campus is on one side of a highway and the Raritan River are a natural resource is on the other. Next slide, please. So as Steve mentioned, sense of place involves place attachment and place meaning. Um, and so these are just some examples of how we've tried to uh, foster both a place attachment and meaning in our students. Next slide, please. Um, the Raritan River runs right next to our New Brunswick campus, um, and the Raritan has a, a rich history which includes strong ties to the university. However, for many Rutgers students, it's simply a physical barrier separating our campuses and just experienced through the window of a bus. Thus, there are many of us involved in um, what we call the Raritan River initiatives on campus who are working to connect the students back to the Raritan and its various stakeholders. Traditionally, we have done this by providing opportunities for students to access the river and interact with community through field trips. Um, but uh, now we have to uh, move forward, given since we can't be on the boat. Um, given our remote classes, we need to bring the river to the students. Um, and we've done this by leveraging work from previous students. Uh, so the video that you were just watching was actually created by a group of students at Rutgers um, a couple of years ago. This was their first trip out on the Raritan um, and their assignment was to document their experience, not necessarily from a content perspective, but more from what was new and meaningful to them. Um, next slide, please. 
So in, in speaking with students, I typically follow up on the video that I just showed with a, another student piece that was created by uh, Dr. Rick Lathrop's geoinformatics class. Um, this virtual field trip is not only pictures of uh, different spots along the mountain, but also provides a historical and cultural lens, lens to these locations as well. Next slide, please. Lastly, something that my colleague Chip Haldeman and I are still in still developing, but I wanted to mention was how we're using geocaching to foster a sense of place along the Raritan. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, geocaching is an outdoor activity. It's, it's kind of like hide and seek, but where participants use GPS to find caches or locations. Um, through this process, the students are really able to explore and pay attention to their surroundings um, as they move along um, the Raritan. And the app also provides them with some context on the cultural and natural history. Next slide, please. Another example at Rutgers and how we're working to foster a sense of place is through the Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience Initiative, it's a mouthful, or C2R2. C2R2 complements the disciplinary training that students receive by providing opportunities to foster systems thinking, as well as social um, and communication skills that are needed to make communities more resilient. Uh, two things that we teach our students um, are that location, the location of a problem defines the groups whose whose partnership should solve it. And perhaps more importantly here is that it's essential to appreciate and incorporate multiple knowledge streams and value systems. In other words, you really need to understand the entire place. Next slide, please. So one of the opportunities that we provide our students are studio courses. Uh, in these courses, students, studio, students excuse me, are given clients, uh, typically municipal leaders or nonprofit groups, and they're asked to collaborate with these clients to address the pressing issue. Through this process, which along with looking at you know, data sets online, um, involves the hearing from the stories directly from stakeholders, meeting with stakeholders, visiting the town, examining its history, and, and really gaining a greater understanding of, of what um, people see as the future of the town. Um, all these activities help to foster a collective sense of place among the students with the area. So for example, one of our first C2R2 studios involved Union Beach, New Jersey. Uh, municipal leaders were provided with plans from the Army Corps of Engineers about a decade ago on how to make a portion of their town more resilient. These plans had not been implemented yet, so they asked our students to work with them to see if what that was proposed um, for so long ago still made sense. Um, so in achieving this outcome, students were not only looking at the various data streams about the land and the people and the migration patterns of Union Beach, but also connecting with the local stakeholders and hearing their opinions on the town and construction. Um, in doing so, this gave them a better sense of, of, um, of, the, of the, the town, its landscape, its history, its politics, and its culture, really helped them form that sense of place. Um, I should mention that the current studio, um, which is focusing to, um, now on Keensburg and Atlantic Highlands, also in New Jersey, um, is working the same way, except students are able to meet with all the stakeholders virtually. And in some ways, it's, it's better because you have access to uh, a larger variety of stakeholders since everybody is home and really not doing too much. Well, I shouldn't say not doing too much, but everybody's around. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, in my last minute or so, I just wanted to share one technique that we have used to help students create meaning. Uh, C2R2 students are trained to interact with models in ways that help facilitate learning, as well as interdisciplinary discussion and community engagement. Along with providing a means to support students in creating the connections within their own understanding of how and really generating that, um, that meaning, place meaning, um, these models uh, also uh, are used to act that or act as a, a boundary object to bridge ideas and um, share ideas uh, with with different people, with each other, and with stakeholders. Um, what uh, the, the tools that we use um, is kind of a concept mapping software called Mental Modeler, and you can see an example of that as on the right. Um, so the whole idea is kind of how do we make our mental models more visible? Next slide, please. 
Um, so as I mentioned, this is absolutely a joint effort of many wonderful people at Rutgers. So I just wanted to thank some of them here. Uh, one person that I, I failed to thank that is, is on here and I really should have is Christina Konsinger. Um, she's been really instrumental in helping me think about um, campus resources and education. Uh, lastly, before I turn it over to Tara, I just wanted to thank her and Juk and Steve for, for really helping me personally think through this concept. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it over to Tara. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, yeah, so my name is Tara Laidla, and I'm going to be chatting just a little bit about shared experience, the community's shared experience as a springboard for building a sense of place. Um, so next slide, please, Juke. Uh, I am the education program manager for a local land trust or a regional land trust. Um, and so my audience is pretty different from what you've been hearing about so far on this call. I work primarily with K-12 students and also with their teachers doing professional development for teachers. Um, I work in the classroom. I do classroom adjacent work. I do informal education. Um, and, you know, usually someone with a land trust would be taking kids out onto the land. We haven't been able to do that quite so much this year. So I was also dipping my toes into some of the um, digital, like creating a digital version of our preserve where kids can come and explore around um, to kind of get at some of that sense of place building. Um, but in general, I work with students where they live or at least in the region where they live, which is a pretty different model uh, from working with college or university students where they might not necessarily have a pre-existing connection to the place. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I do a lot of partnering with other organizations in the community. And one of them that I've been working with um, since this spring is the Southern Oregon Fire Ecology Education Project, which is an initiative that was originally intended to adapt an existing K-12 curriculum to reflect regional um, fire adapted ecosystems. So like swapping in species that live here, that kind of thing. Um, the project was also intended to support teachers in using fire as an integrating context for learning. So looking across disciplines um, and, and then also to teach students um, uh, te to teach students content about fire science, fire ecology, land management, and also career pathways that have to do with fire. Um, and, and so this was, you know, very much, uh, uh, there, there was some of the, the place um, attachment, but that wasn't really the focus. It was primarily this intellectual understanding of how fire moves in a landscape. Um, but then uh, we had something happen in our neck of the woods. So next slide, please, Juke. Um, you may have heard about the Almeida fire um, in Southern Oregon. Uh, that is where I live. That is my home. Um, and that's the home of our students. Um, and so this fire was, um, a lot of fire ecologists don't like to use the word catastrophic to describe high intensity fire because it has such negative connotations, but this was a catastrophic fire. Um, so this happened on September 8th and um, it burned for most of the day on the 8th overnight into the, um, the morning of the 9th. And next slide, please. This is what we woke up to in the morning. Um, it, like pretty thorough devastation. And, and what started as a grass fire um, just wicked right up a greenway and into two small towns. Um, and in fact, 50% of our students in the town of Phoenix, Oregon, um, lost their homes that day. And so suddenly this, this um, curriculum about fire, we needed to look at it a little bit more closely. Um, so next slide, please. Suddenly, like we were tasked with how do you teach about fire after truly catastrophic fire? Um, you know, not just like the hillside across the way burned and it was a forest fire, um, but it'll recover, but like kids' homes burning down, people fleeing. Um, and so it becomes this question of how do you balance major shifts in emotional reactions and place attachment, um, right? Because we have the whole range, we're hearing the whole range from people saying, um, you know, I am going to come back to the land where I've been living um, for my whole life or for, you know, families for generations, and we're going to rebuild our home exactly as it was, all the way to people saying, I'm done. I am leaving Southern Oregon and I am never looking back because this was so traumatic. Um, and, and so that 
that shift in place attachment is something that we have to address. You can't, yeah, it's a huge trigger. You can't just brush this off and say, oh, nope, we're still going to teach about fire ecology. But it's like not one of the options anymore. Um, and so, but we don't want to just say, okay, this is too stressful. It's too scary. It's too traumatic. We're not going to teach students about fire ecology and land management, like, because that's also not, that's also not one of our options. Um, and so how do we, how do we balance teaching the content, teaching the, you know, the place meaning, like the intellectual component of fire on a landscape, how do you balance that with the, the emotional reality for many of our students and our teachers? Um, and so we're looking for opportunities to integrate those two components. And, and we really want our students to walk away with a positive sense of place about their home. Um, you know, that that uh, spectrum that Steve mentioned that you can have positive attachment and you can also have negative attachment. Like I, I'm traumatized by this too, of course. And, and so I drive through some of these places and I think, oh, I don't wanna be here, but I want to rebuild a, a sense of love and pride and caring about this place. So we're looking at a new initiative. Um, on the next slide, there's a little bit of information. Um, it's about storytelling. So the SOFI project, the Fire Ecology Education Initiative has developed a series of prompts that encourage students to think about and also articulate both um, the emotional place attachment, like what were they feeling during this event and also the intellectual component, like what was happening. And we really like storytelling as a, as a teaching tool because it's so equitable, right? It lets students share in any language um, in any format, we're inviting folks to um, write or send photos, send drawings. We're um, offering to go to people and film them if they would be more comfortable and if they don't have the equipment. Um, and they get to share their own lived unique, um, you know, their own lived experience. And they can share as much or as little as they feel comfortable with. So it becomes this really dynamic tool um, for encouraging folks to think about sense of place and think about what this means for them in their own life. Um, and on the next slide, we'll see there are a couple of other benefits of storytelling. Not only is it an opportunity for folks who lived through this to, to process what happened, both individually and as part of a group, um, that we're working on this with the local fire departments because the officials, like those stories offer a window for officials to understand why people reacted the way they did um, and like how you might go about alerting people in the future um, when this happens again, because let's be real, it's not impossible that it will happen again. Um, but then we're also really excited about using these stories with the author's permission, of course, as primary source documents so that in the future, this fire is it, like forever going to be a part of the story of this place now. Um, but by having these firsthand accounts, um, we're hoping that students in the future will have the opportunity to kind of connect with the sense of place that current residents are feeling and, and working through as this, um, this just wild thing is unfolding in our community. Um, and so those stories will have that kind of twofold um, emotional and intellectual piece to go with the more observable and measurable impacts of the fire. Um, so we're really looking forward to having that as a resource so that when we teach fire ecology and fire um, management in the future, we have this um, to draw on this like really vivid sense of place component. Um, next slide, please. Um, it, and I will say, you know, this this horrible trauma is a really obvious kind of rallying point for the community to talk about. Um, but thinking about shared experience as an opportunity for developing sense of place, both individually in students and a, as a kind of class or as a community, um, it, it doesn't have to be something that's super scary and traumatic. Although unfortunately, those tend to be the things that we remember. And I'm seeing in the chat some stuff, you know, yeah, like the Christchurch and flooding and you know of course those are the things that we remember like of course you remember where you were when the horrible thing happened but it could also be a big weather event you know um sometimes there's you know the ice storm of 97 that everyone remembers um yeah or covid great example um you know like what's the intersection of your covid experience with where you're where you're living um you might also use a local tradition um or, and I think the local tradition perhaps works better for smaller communities, rural communities. Like I think of 
um, Wayland, Minnesota with their standstill parade. Like everyone around Wayland knows about the standstill parade and probably has some connection with that, whereas that wouldn't work in a bigger population center. So the, the key is to find something that all of your students can connect with so that it is equitable. And everyone doesn't necessarily have to have like a super positive memory or connection to that place, but just something so that you can get into that conversation. And if your students are willing, I do think it's really powerful to then compare stories um, and, and put them side by side and say, why do we have these different perceptions of this place? Um, and, and if you're in a larger uh, population center, I think that something like a river, like Carrie was talking about, way that, that physically um, goes past lots of different students' homes, uh, even during this distance learning, can serve as kind of the shared experience for gathering stories in this way. Um, so I, I invite you to just take a moment to think about a shared experience or a shared feature, um, a shared tradition that you might choose as a storytelling prompt for your class um, or for a group that you're working with to, to help them explore that kind of connection of place meaning and place attachment help them build that sense of place. Um, and I'm seeing a couple of ideas before I even posed this question. I'm seeing a couple of ideas in the chat, but if you'd like to toss them in the chat, feel free. Um, and uh, I think that that is all I've got. So on the next slide, that's my contact information, tara at landconserve.org. Um, feel free to drop me a line if you'd like to chat about this at all. Um, and thank you so much uh, for being here with us. And now I will turn it back over to um, Juke, who will uh, kind of take us through some Q&A with all three of us presenters. Anna, you just put me on the spot, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like... <laughs> Um, there are some great ideas on the chat that's, uh, that's coming up and you guys all see it. I don't see any questions though. Thanks, Brett. Uh, I don't see any questions though, but uh, would anyone of you would like to address the comments like AJ just says great place-based storytelling project uh, and there is a link there. Any one of you want to address that? Yeah, you know, I'm not familiar with that project, but I love the idea um, that you just leave it on a voicemail because I think sometimes with storytelling, there's a little bit of anxiety or a lot of anxiety about the connection between you and your audience. And with a voicemail, it feels very safe. <laughs> At least I would feel very safe talking to a voicemail. I love that. I just clicked on the link and it's great. It has uh, like a little, I'm gonna share my screen. It's much better than me talking. So this is the link that uh, just clicked on chat. And this is AJ just, Allison just sent and it's, uh, where you wanna be and there are different parts. Um, and there is a poem right there, right? Wow, this is gonna be a huge time sink for me because I wanna read every one of them, but I'm getting out of here. I think we should all ex explore that. It's a great, like now I wanna do it. And I also think that that's really cool that it puts it on a map, yeah. right? And so there again is the connection between a, a physical location and um, a, a personal attachment to that location. And I think that that has the potential, whether you're using this tool or making something like this with your students, um, that has a, a lot of potential as a way for exploring how people um, feel about a landscape. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that, AJ. What a cool, what a cool project. Um, Brett's a question, any advice for uh, those of us who might have a chance to prepare material for future strategies like Pacific Northwest, Megathrust, Quakes? Um, 
something that we've been working with with the Sophie Project is trauma-informed um, learning and trauma-informed curriculum. Um, and, and that's like a whole other uh, thing. But basically it's this idea that like this, these kinds of experiences live in your body for the rest of your life. And so think like preempting that and thinking about, um, you know, how can we be prepared for that? I don't have um, advice beyond that other than just knowing that like, yeah, it's gonna happen. And how do you prepare your students? Because we're all already talking about that with fire. Like, how do we talk about this in a way that's empowering? Um, and so we wrote some lessons about like getting your go bag ready and having a plan with your family. And I realized that with the Pacific Northwest um, mega thrust event, that may not really help you a lot. <laughs> Um, but like, how can you empower your learners so that it's not just this like totally terrifying thing, but rather there are specific steps and actions that they can take to feel ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would echo a lot of what Tara said. Um, I, one of the things that I think is interesting too, in, in really getting a sense of place is, um, identifying networks. Um, so support networks. So if, if you have an idea to, um, of kind of the support networks within a community before a disaster, you can kind of leverage those to, to recover a bit more quickly afterwards. Um, and so really understanding the dynamics more than just the roads and everything else um, really is, is important to, to disaster recovery. I see comments about nature journaling. That's a great idea. Like Brianna just sent this high school environmental science teacher and sending equipment home so they can students can develop questions about their place. Any one of you done any nature journaling as part of your projects? I, yeah, I actually, I, through the Oregon Natural Resources Education Project, I lead PD events about nature journaling for teachers. Um, and the short version is that I would highly recommend the John Muir Laws Guide to Teaching Nature Journaling, if you're interested in like a crash course in nature journaling, um, super, super high quality. Although that is more, it's next generation science standards aligned. So it might be more appropriate for K-12, um, but it's a great place to start. Um, Carrie, you too. Yeah, um, just a lot but more informally, um, just had students, you know, go out in the environment with just kind of pad and thinking through uh, just and making sure they turn their cell phones off <laughs> and actually being present in the environment. So I'll, I'll just add, yeah, that, that there are lots of sort of in the past, some people may be familiar with photo voice, which was which was an ethnographic way, still very active where people people tend to document. Um, typically, it re revolves around environmental or political issues in the community and, and it's using photography combined with narrative. And then what we're working on now, Tom, again, Tom is in this, this chat, is working on doing the same thing with three-dimensional, 360-degree cameras, which are becoming increasingly cheap. And so students can actually create uh, virtual and, and uh, panoramic-based uh, virtual field trips that are, that are actually pretty easy to do. And, and it's the same thing. They're documenting their sense of place by going out. And right now, that's a little bit more challenging. But hopefully soon, we'll have that opportunity again. Uh, this chat question is going to be saved somewhere, Mitchell. Yes, I can save the chat um, since there's a lot of good, well, not good, great information in there and a lot of resources. So yeah, I'll make sure we, we uh, keep that as a record and make it available. Um, and I will say too that I've been working with Google Earth um, free, easy to get to online, and you can make your own Google Earth projects and drop pins and connect photos and comments and videos to that as well. Um, I'm not familiar with Sifter, but um, if you want something that's web-based, Google Earth can do a lot. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the chat that I'm going to look back on <laughs> once we're off the call. This is great. Yeah. 
story maps also. I just see RGIS story map, and I was just gonna put a plug in for that one. That's really good. Like I have used that, and it's simple enough, but it is beautiful that you can make some really cool maps. And Carrie, you have done RGIS story map too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that uh, Raritan River tour that that I had shown was through that. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some fantastic resources here. Well, so, shall we turn it back over to Mitchell to close us out because we're almost at the, the end of the hour? I think so. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you all, Steve, Carrie, Tara, Juke, um, for, for leading today's presentation. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, really quickly, I just want to say we do have uh, another webinar coming up uh, in early December on building inclusive STEM communities through partnership with students. Uh, if that is something of interest to you, I encourage you to register. As always, uh, we appreciate your feedback. And if you don't mind taking a few minutes to complete our webinar evaluation, I've put a link to that in the chat box. Um, we appreciate your ideas and suggestions. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you again to our presenters. Thank you all for joining. And we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us.